Thank you, Jade. And I'm delighted to welcome all of you to this webinar. Um, I'm Sue Sheridan. I'm co-founder of Patients for Patient Safety US, um, a chapter of the WHO's Global Patients for Patient Safety Network and Program. We're an organization of uh, developed by and led by patients and family, most of us who've experienced harm from unsafe care, as well as those committed to patient safety. I also want to welcome Jennifer Lundblad, President and CEO of Stratus Health, and Lisa Juilliard, Director of Patient Family Engagement at the Minnesota Alliance of Patient Safety, known as MAPS. So today I'm going to talk about uh, a, a changing landscape of patient power and engagement, and it's actually a perfect time to be talking about patient family engagement with this, um, with the National Action Alliance and launching this new effort. We have the opportunity to um, rethink and reimagine patient family engagement. So what brings me here today is that um, I got engaged um, in patient safety 28 years ago after um, my newborn son suffered brain damage from his newborn jaundice that resulted in a lifetime of disability and my late husband pat died from the failure to communicate a malignant pathology since then i've been engaged in adequacy groups the who i led the patient family engagement uh program at bacori um, as well as cms and so I can say that over the years, over the last 28 years, I have witnessed the evolution of both patient safety and patient and family engagement. Now, again, what brings us all here is the fact that um, we haven't made enough progress in patient safety over the last 10 years. Um, and so we're going to you know, revisit why haven't we done that and where does patient and family engagement play a role in that? So if we look at the evolution of patient and family engagement, um, you can go to the next slide, please. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I'm gonna I'm gonna back up here and just just remind our readers and our, our viewers um, the questions that we're gonna answer in both of our presentations today. And we're gonna run out these questions. What are the foundational elements of including patients and families in safety? Um, what new op opportunities are out there or exist to engage patients and families to make care safer, moving from advisory roles to inviting them to become part of co-design, building trust, relationships, and leading to action? And more importantly, how do we go about implementing patient family engagement? Next slide. So you can see that I've, I've um, titled my presentation, People Powered Patient Safety and democratizing patient safety for safer care. And this goes back to the, the, um, the changing landscape of patient and family engagement, where I mentioned that 28 years ago when I stepped into this world, I don't think the term patient and family engagement was even coined. And when it first came out um, as something that was written about, it was really about empowering patients, encouraging patients and clinicians to have conversations, patients to speak up, um, patients to ask questions, and then it evolved more into patient and family engagement, where healthcare facilities and governments and researchers began inviting patients and families um, into the design of policy and organizational design, um, asking for feedback on topics really that mattered mostly to them, meaning the governments, healthcare facilities, and researchers. This approach really is a top-down approach. Um, or we might call it an institutionalized approach where governments, healthcare facilities, clinicians, and others, they create opportunities for patients and families to partner to improve patient safety. Now, this is a good model, and it has generated um, success in pockets. However, this structure of institutionalizing patient family engagement and, and having it in a manner that patients and, and, and families are invited into a structured approach to patient family engagement um, has not generated the level of urgency or safe patient-centered equitable care over the past two decades. So it seems to me that it's missing a companion approach and a companion piece to patient family engagement. So this is the time that we can reimagine, rethink, and maybe even rebrand patient family engagement where patient safety is to be co-produced. You're gonna hear about this um, from 
Lisa and um, where we co-produce patient family engagement in an equal decision-making process that reflects the experiences, the outcomes, and frankly, the expectations of patients and families and communities. We're gonna rebrand patient family engagement where there's a new people powered approach or a level to patient family engagement. Um, we're introducing this dimension where patient safety improvements and partnerships can be initiated by patients, families, and civil society, actually apart from government and healthcare, the healthcare ecosystem. Also, we're gonna imagine a patient and family engagement, involved patient family engagement, where along with patients and families um, from patient, patient safety organizations, we're gonna broaden that scope to invite and bring in patients and families from disease groups who are more likely to experience a patient safety event because they're frequently in and out of the hospital system like cancer patients, heart patients, and sepsis patients. We're gonna mobilize and build capacity of patients from disease-based groups, from population-based groups, from the disability groups, from those groups who are misdiagnosed more often, from the um, marginalized groups who suffer inequities in patient safety. So we're expanding that that group of patients families to to reach into a, a deeper pool of patients and families and we're also going to envision patient family engagement um, that is hardwired and that it's embedded as maybe even unconditional um, and it is the way of doing business you know in the government in healthcare systems uh, and with other stakeholders next slide I wanna share um, a slide that is um, really meaningful to me and others. Like I mentioned, Patients for Patient Safety US is um, under the umbrella of the WHO's Patients for Patient Safety. And WHO came out in 2021 with an extremely comprehensive and very bold um, action plan that uh, has this quote in it. Um, Patient engagement and empower is perhaps the most powerful tool to improve patient safety. And so I want us to all remember that as the most powerful tool in improving patient safety. I don't think it, we've, we've get, given it that credit in the past couple of decades. Let's go to the next slide. Now, the Global Patient Safety Action Plan has seven strategic objectives that they believe if everything is accomplished in synergy with each other, that we will reduce um, avoidable harm to patients in healthcare. Now they've identified seven strategic objectives. One of the seven is patient and family engagement. And so I wanna read to you their five levels or their five strategies to improve patient and family engagement. And this fits synergistically with the plan that came out actually after the WHO's. And so that's why we're aligning behind WHO's um, action plan. And then the our national action plan to advance patient safety came out. And there's, there's beautiful synergy between the two, but I wanna read these buckets that are true in both the WHO's and our national action plan to advance patient safety. Number one, and this is kind of the gestalt of everything, engage patients, families, and civil society organizations in the co-development of policies, plans, strategies, programs, and guidelines. And I wanna, I wanna, I, I, I wanna define something right now. Civil society really isn't used much in the United States, the terminology. And so as I use the term civil society, it actually just means groups of patients, consumers, citizens, people um, outside government, outside healthcare that are organized around something that they're passionate about. So when I say civil society, it could be patient groups like Patients for Patient Safety US. It could mean disease-based groups, population-based groups. It could mean um, uh, religious-based groups, gender-based groups. So I'm gonna use the term civil society and WHO has brought civil society into the landscape of patient family engagement. Bucket number two is learn from the experiences of patients and families exposed to unsafe care to develop more equitable patient-centered solutions. Now there's this great saying, and I don't know who to give the credit to, but um, that is there is a growing divide between what patients want and patients need and what they see and what they experience. So we have to ask ourselves, 
Are we designing patient safety based on what patients want and need? Are we capturing what they see and experience? So this bucket is let's learn, let's commit to learning from the experience of patients and families exposed to unsafe care and develop more solutions that are more equitable, patient safety and safe. The third bucket is build the capacity of patient advocates and champions in patient safety. This is to empower, now this, this language that WHO and others are using, this empowerment of patients and families. You know, we need to invest in and build a core of skilled patients, family members, and civil society leaders to help advance patient safety as partners. The fourth bucket is establish the principle and practice of openness and transparency, including disclosure to patients and family members, including um, transparency to data, including transparency of our um, patient records and our notes. And the fifth bucket is um, to provide information education to patients and families, again, to give them, equip them with the information and the tools that they need to keep themselves safe. Next slide. So after looking at this and digesting, you know, all of the strategies for patient and family engagement, both from our national Safer Together, our national action plan for patient safety, as well as the WHOs. If we step back in and look at what is this message, we look at a much bigger landscape in um, patient and family engagement. So we see this landscape shifting from kind of um, an institutional approach, which is important, to a much broader approach. Now, starting with the first box, patients and families engage during the patient journey. Now, at one time when we talked about, you know, patient family engagement in care, we used to see a picture of a, you know, a sick patient in the bed, maybe asking questions. And now when we think about patient family engagement during the patient journey, this is a, at times, a very long trajectory of time. This is patients and families, and we're going to dive into this a little more, but not only participating in care, you know, at the bedside, but they're pa participating when they're at home and across the whole journey. They're participating with healthcare facilities and other stakeholders. And I'm going to show you how this jur patient journey has expanded over the last decade to really engage patients and families. The other bucket, um, the bottom left corner, is patients and families and communities. Now, when I say communities, I mean local communities, national communities, um, you know, international communities, to, you know, the groups of patients who care about this, to co-produce patient safety improvement initiatives. Now, this is with governments, healthcare facilities, research, medical educators, um, accreditors. You know, this captures all stakeholders to drive patient safety where we're engaged in co-producing patient safety improvement initiatives. Now, the final bucket, this new bucket, this is the new arrival, uh, arrival to um, patient family engagement. This is the bucket called advocacy and awareness raising with community, patient, and civil society organizations. Now, this is um, kind of a bold new um, newcomer into the landscape of patient and family engagement. This is, this is kind of responding to the fact that um, Traditionally, patient family engagement have, has been uh, where patients and families are invited into research or into healthcare systems or into the government to help solve problems. This is kind of flipping the model where um, we're not necessarily waiting for that invitation, but instead we become the inviter and we initiate patient and safety, patient safety, um, reaching out to our governments, to our healthcare systems. Um, to research and bringing them into our world. So it's kind of flipping the table a little bit, but this is an interesting bucket that I think um, without this bucket, I think patient family engagement and patient safety will stay pretty stagnant. And as you can see by these arrows, this is a dynamic flow of information and, and kind of um, interdependence of all of us to push forward for patient safety. Next slide. So I'm going to dig down a little more into the patient journey. Now, I'm not going to read all of this, but I want to share um, that patient family engagement, you know, is participating, as we've always known, in care with our healthcare workers and joint decision making, self-advocacy, escalation of care. Patients now are wearing wearables or getting monitored. 
Um, they are they are far more involved in self care, home management, and so this this part of the patient journey has expanded. Now they also engage with healthcare facilities, sharing and reporting unsafe care, so that there can be learning. They're doing this via complaints and grievances, causal analysis, age caps, PROs, storytelling, etc. And the other now it even goes another step further where patients and families are sharing and reporting to national, state, and regulatory bodies, uh, creditors, licensing bodies, even to patient and civil society organizations. They're reporting their data and they're sharing their stories. So let's go to the next slide. So what does patient family engagement look like in co-producing patient safety improvement initiatives? And I'm just listing a few here, but patient safeties, patient and family and communities need to be involved in patient safety policies, plans, strategies, programs, and guidelines. From day one, they need to be involved in planning, developing, uh, disseminating, and implementing all of those. Um, patients and families need to be engaged in safety research and quality improvement programs, identifying really what matters to them and the outcomes, how to measure the outcomes that matter to them. We need to develop mechanisms to learn better from the experience of patients and families. Here I have a picture of a survey. How can we recreate or add to our age caps to include questions that matter to patients about safety? Medical professions education is something that we can co-create by patients and families engaging in identifying competencies, in creating curricula, and de develop, uh, deli delivering the curriculum. The, the last, the next bucket is um, patient engagement materials and information. So much of our patient engagement and our patient safety materials are not created or co-created with patients and families and they end up um, sometimes uh, too medicalized and hard to understand. We need to learn how to craft patient education materials that activate patients and family members to take action. And the last one is on co-producing policies on disclosure, transparency, action to medical or access to medical records and patient activated rapid response. Next slide. Now, this is the new bucket in patient family engagement. And again, this is the advocacy and awareness raising um, where patients and families advocate. Now we've been advocating for patient safety as a national priority that along with that comes funding and oversight and measures. We're advocating for mandatory trans transparency and inclusion, mandatory inclusion of diverse patients and families in all safety improvement efforts. We're raising awareness about harm from unsafe care to our families, to our communities, to our states. We're sharing about patient safety reporting systems. When patients reach out to us, how do they effectively report that? And the right to access to medical records and informed consent. We're organizing, recruiting, and mobilizing diverse patient safety advocates to be engaged in safety improvements. We're developing and disseminating patient information and information on patient safety that is patient created, patient driven, and patient disseminated. And uh, we're collecting and curating patient stories and data of harm from unsafe care. So these are just examples of this new bucket of patient family engagement in advocacy and awareness raising. We're testifying. We are uh, providing public comment. Um, we do a march every September for awareness raising of WHO's World Patient Safety uh, Day. So th these are areas in which we wanna explore how do we bring in other stakers to join this bucket? Next slide, please. So finally, what actions can you take to engage and empower patients and families? We need to take this commitment and take this step. Number one, if you're not engaged in um, patient family engagement, secure strong commitment from your leadership, number one. Number two, if you're not, again, not engaged in this, there are great tools out there. So conduct a landscape assessment of what you're actually already doing in PFE in your organization. When I say PFE, that's patient and family engagement. Next, establish policies, hardwire this into your institution. Establish clearly stated policies, strategies, buckets, and structures that require and support patient family engagement that is diverse and inclusive of the populations that you serve. Develop alliances and commu with community, patient, and disease-based organizations. This is something that I think rarely happens with um, governments and healthcare um, 
organizations reach out to those disease-based groups, reach out to those um, rights-based groups and population-based groups and bring them under your roof to learn about them, to redesign your healthcare. Utilize effective methods, uh, engagement methods, utilize storytelling. Um, WHO will be launching soon um, a uh, patient safety story tell a storytelling toolkit that was created by patients and family members. Offer capacity building and utilize principles that really do empower patients. Design and implement mechanisms that effectively learn from patient experience and that you commit to learn taking those experiences and putting them into your quality improvement efforts. And finally, create processes to monitor and evaluate the effectiveness of patient and family engagement empowerment. Next slide. So this next slide is just a call to action to you. This is really a question of will. This isn't an expensive endeavor. It's not really even a timely endeavor. This is an attitude of valuing the input of patients and families. It takes courageous leadership. It'll take every one of us to ensure that all involved in healthcare are as safe as possible as soon as possible. Thank you. Great, thank you, Sue, that was amazing. Um, I know you have expanded my thinking on it and I would really like to hear from others um, about how they're processing what you've shared and maybe some of their experiences, particularly those who may be um, already doing some of the things that you have mentioned. Um, so if you would like uh, to respond, um, the next slide, please. Jade, we lost your audio there for just a minute. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm not sure what happened. Um, <laughs> um, if you would like to make a comment, uh, please enter your um, comment into the chat. Or if you would like to be heard, please raise your hand and we will open up your line so that you can respond verbally. And I'm seeing that uh, John James is raising his hand. Hang on just a second. John, we are going to unmute you. We're going to try to unmute you. I'm sorry, I am not able to unmute you. Um, oh, there we go. Um, John, are you, can we hear you now? Uh, can you hear me? That's yes, I can. Thank you. Okay. Let me, let me go ahead. So. So wonderful presentation. Wow. What a landscape and, and what changes have been made since you and I got in this business a long time ago. The idea of patient empowerment is so important. Uh, and I like the idea of getting up front of issues, like going to the power sources, if you will, the agencies and the the, the political leaders that can make a difference uh, for patient safety. And one thing I'd like to see happen, I think AHRQ is a sponsor of this webinar, and I'm trying to get them through their shared decision-making platform to communicate with CMS a module to train patients to know what shared decision making is. Most people, if you talk to somebody on the street, they don't have a clue. Even informed consent, a simpler version, they don't have a clue. So I would urge people, after listening to Sue's presentation, interact with these federal agencies and push them, push them to set policies that empower patients. And then, what well, in my dream, I'd like to see CMS, see CMS offer a little reward for, uh, Medicare beneficiaries to actually learn about shared decision making, maybe a $50 Walmart gift card or something. But there's just a way you can draw in patients and make them empowered one by one to deal with a system that we know is uh, still pretty broken. Thank you. 
Thank you, John. We really appreciate your comment. And um, being from ARC, I would definitely take back uh, your your suggestion, which is a great one. Thank you. Um, I, we have received a lot of comments in the chat, and I'll just read a couple of them um, about the importance of uh, having leadership engagement, walk the walk, not just the talk, um, including patients and families and in, in everything that we do, getting, gaining that commitment from, from leadership, um, Katie is responding, her number one takeaway, patient and family involvement in care is not expensive. It is an attitude and a behavior. Um, patient safety is a collaboration between providers and patients that begins with a commitment by senior leaders. Seeing the, the role of leadership here is a very important one. Um, Sue, do you have any, um, uh, any comments to uh, what John said or to what we've read in the chat? Well, I would just agree with everything that has been what said, to be honest. And I think that what we're recognizing that patient family engagement is more than just patient family engagement. Um, it, it encompasses all stakeholders, um, all groups, and we need to, you know, there's a, we need to create this partnership and synergy where we're all connected um, where HRQ doesn't work in a silo, CMS doesn't work in a silo, patients don't work in a silo, that we come together and we, you know, I mentioned kind of this top-down approach that historically patient family engagement has been institutionalized, but this people-powered approach, this bottom-up approach, that's where we're going to find the sweet spot, spot, to be honest, with this bottom-up approach. I don't like to say bottom-up because that means patients are at the bottom, and I don't think we are, but if we have this people-powered approach, coming up and we have the top down approach. We have to find that sweet spot where we all reside. Great. Thank you, Sue. If I can have the next slide, please, and we'll move on uh, to our next presentation. Uh, can I turn things over to you, Dr. Lundblad? Thank you so much, Jade. Absolutely. And Sue, thank you for um, your many, many years of being such a strong voice and advocate and then for framing up today what we're here to talk about. Um, we've been at this a long time at Stratus Health and we are so excited for the resurgence of patient safety, I might call it. And then in particular for this focus on the co-creation trajectory. I think we're ready for that for the next iteration, which is awesome. So I'm Jennifer Lundblad and I'm delighted to be part of the session today and be able to team up with my colleague, Lisa, to help tell the story of patient safety in Minnesota. I'll be sharing just a few slides which provide background information about how the two organizations here today, Stratus Health and the Minnesota Alliance for Patient Safety, or MAPS, are involving patients and families in ever deepening and more meaningful ways in safety work. And then I'll, I'll turn it over to Lisa to really dig into that. So if you go to the next slide, first, just a bit about my organization, Stratus Health. We've been working to improve quality and safety for more than 50 years, not only in Minnesota, but nationally, bringing safety science and more recently implementation science to our work. So improving safety is part of our mission. And on the next side, slide, you'll see a sampling of our safety focused projects. So if you go there, um, you know, there's things that we do in Minnesota around the longstanding adverse health events program and system that has existed and was groundbreaking when it was established back in 2004. We do work that's about spreading best practices around comprehensive unit based safety programs, CUSP and the work that has emerged out of Johns Hopkins. We're focused on adverse drug events on opioids and supporting those that are most vulnerable, including the uh, Indian Health Service hospitals through our partnership to advance tribal health. So just wanted to give you a flavor and a sampling of the kinds of works that we're doing there. But if you go to the next slide, the important part of the Stratus Health journey for today's purposes is really related to MAPS. So as with many states, uh, we in Minnesota established a patient safety coalition immediately following the release of the seminal IOM reports to Air is Human and Crossing the Quality Chasm which brought uh, not only healthcare, but public attention to safety in really significant ways. Our coalition in Minnesota did fantastic work and had broad engagement. And as with many coalitions, the early work of MAPS was primarily focused on hospital safety, since that's where the data and the attention were at the time. We were a volunteer coalition with no paid staff and our partners at the Minnesota Hospital Association served as the conveners and facilitators. Then after about a decade or so, maybe a little longer, many of us who were leaders in MAPS started asking, so what's next? 
Um, do we need a safety coalition anymore? What's the work of the future? And so we decided to test that concept. And I was part of a group of MAPS leaders who met with, in Minnesota, the health systems, state agencies, payers, and others. And the resounding answer was yes, there's still a huge need and there's more work to do. And it should be more broadly focused across the continuum of care. So at that point, we felt MAPS would be best served to be its own independent organization. So it was established as its own 501c3 nonprofit organization in 2015, and then adopted a new mission, um, Safe Care Everywhere. Again, reflecting that notion that we wanted safety across the full continuum of care, not just so focused on hospitals. So if you go to the next slide, You've kind of figured out that we at Stratus Health have been leaders in MAPS since its inception. I personally have had the privilege of doing that as well. And we were a, what's called a founding member when MAPS was incorporated in 2015. Our work, Stratus Health and MAPS, is so mission aligned and collaborative uh, over many, many years. And after MAPS incorporated in 2014 as its own organization, they soon realized, and I was serving on the board at the time, that they had a bigger, bolder mission than they had capacity for. So they sought a partner to affiliate with. And we were so fortunate that Stratus Health rose to the top of that list. And in 2017, MAPS became a subsidiary of Stratus Health. So today we work even more closely than we have over the previous 20 plus years. And um, we, really have created a nest, if you want to think of it that way, for MAPS to be able to focus on its safety work, again, in partnership and collaboration with Stratus Health, but many things on its own as well. So I'm so proud of the work that MAPS is doing and the, I would say, both distinctive and groundbreaking ways that MAPS is engaging patients and families which I think can be a model for others, which is why when Jade reached out to be part of today's session, I couldn't think of a better spotlight than to put on the work of MAPS. So with that, I'm just uh, so pleased to uh, turn this over to my partner and colleague, Lisa. Thank you so much, Jennifer. And um, first of all, just thank you for your leadership to MAPS. And um, it's just fun to be on an official webinar together for the first time after all these years. Um, so I am going to uh, speak today about creatively co-creating safe care with patients and families. Next slide, please. I have some pretty simple ways to think about the foundations of uh, partnering and co-designing with patients and families. I do, uh, MAPS believes that the way that we are going to get to safe care everywhere is really through that partnership. And it starts with inviting the patients and families in. So often patients and families don't even know that they can have a place at the table. And so inviting them in is key, including them throughout. So as much as possible, whenever you can um, invite patients to be part of your work groups. Invest in their ideas, um, even if it's something very small, if there's one thing they, that they um, suggest, try to run with it. And increase their influence, share their work, um, give them more opportunities to do things with you, and um, then they will be more motivated to help you in the future. Uh, it, when I first started this work a, a decade ago, patient and family engagements was really just getting started. And the focus was really on creating patient and family advisory councils, uh, specifically in the hospitals. It was a great place to start. There was a lot of advising. That was kind of the focus where they would bring their work in that they were doing and, and kind of get a check mark um, around it. Uh, but to Sue's point, we want to have them um, now be more active um, in the role of, of partnership. Um, I know a lot of people probably have questions about the process and policies around this work and the how to's, uh, but honestly, I think the most important thing is to start to begin to talk about this in a new way um, where patients and families are considered experts, just like um, every other professional involved. We maybe need a shift in hearts and minds towards more authentic partnerships. 
And I would say the responsibility lies with the organizations uh, to create new opportunities and to reframe those conversations so that they feel included. This is really a way to build trusting relationships and from the point of care and beyond. Um, I would say when it comes to safety also that patients and families typically don't understand that they need to be engaged in their care to be safe until they aren't safe or until they've experienced um, some sort of harm. Um, so it's, it's a trick, it's kind of tricky to get them involved in the front end. Next slide, please. Um, this is an example of uh, MAPS work. MAPS has really valued patient partnerships since it began over 20 years ago. Uh, from the beginning, our patient safety conferences um, were launched with multiple uh, patients telling their stories of harm. In fact, I was one of the stories back in 2008, and it began my own journey in to do this work. Um, the focus of the work and the patient partnerships have evolved, and this is kind of where we're at uh, today. I'm going to briefly touch on uh, four of them, um, but the, the you can see the full breadth of our work here. Um, in the last few years, we have started both a statewide network of patients and families and a statewide network of safety leaders, which include many of the chief quality officers in our state. Um, our hope is that eventually those two will be um, joined and they will meet together. Um, I'm going to be talking about how we've advocated and promoted in person care partners, how we um, have worked on a diagnostic error project. And um, I'm going to briefly touch on the community advisory boards in assisted living. We are also very involved in, in the evolution of the adverse event reporting system. We have many uh, database of many patient stories that we um, will share with our organizations and we provide opportunities for patients and families uh, to network and brainstorm. Next slide, please. So at the beginning of the pandemic, MAPS um, was working in a lot of facilities. And um, as you know, we weren't able to go into those facilities pretty quickly and we, we needed to pivot our work. Um, so that's when the statewide network of patients and families uh, was started. Um, we knew that a lot of PFACs in different organizations were, were also being, um, were not meeting and were being shut down. And so that was our first ask. We invited PFAC um, members from across the state to join in our weekly phone calls. Um, and we started the sessions with what is missing in the COVID discussions that could impact safety. We had about 50. Um, 50 to 60 people attending and quickly and unanimously they landed on creating a document outlining the need for an in person uh, care partner uh, to ensure safe care. Um, they met weekly for about 6 months. We began each uh, meeting with a story. I do have a link on on the slides if you're interested in seeing the document and it was um, endorsed by multiple uh, healthcare organizations across um, across our state. So, next slide, please. We, we really focused in on the work to create that document. We took um, everybody's um, experiences and opinions to help craft the document. Um, we had a, a foundational thought that most people who receive care in a hospital are in a vulnerable state. And so we know that vulnerable adults can re have someone next to them when they're receiving care. And, and we felt like that was still true for people that were just receiving care. Um, we realized that this is maybe the best way to encourage patient and family engagement at the at the point of care at the bedside and that it really does help to establish a trusting relationship with um, the healthcare system. Um, the in person care partners are far more than just a visitor to the facility. They are they are and should be welcome members of the care team um, because they improve safety. They are an extra set of eyes and ears 
um, they provide an additional layer of safety. They can observe and communicate important details and changes um, in their behavior or their condition that maybe the um, healthcare provider isn't aware of. Um, they can add in complex um, information that they might not be aware of or be able to gather from the patient in the bed. Of course, they provide emotional support and, and contribute to their well being. Um, but they also alleviate caregiving burdens for staff and providers. We know right now that there's a very, um, it's very difficult to with staffing. And when we have care partners, they, they can help with the cares, even if it's as little as um, getting a drink of water, putting on the call light, um, getting some lotion on their hands. So all of those things were important. But we really wanted to make sure that the safety of the patient was uh, first and foremost. Uh, and they, at the end, also, they allowed being in person allowed that care partner to understand how they needed to be cared for and implement that care upon discharge, which was so important to um, the healing when they got home. Next slide, please. So once we completed that document and um, it was kind of um, published and out on its way, um, the partners, the patients and families were so engaged, they wanted to keep meeting. And so we do continue to meet monthly. We actually um, also have three work groups that meet um, one to three times a month. Um, I know sometimes it seems like inviting patient partners to do the work might seem more difficult, but honestly, it can relieve a lot of burden. Um, these three work groups do a lot of independent meeting. They do provide lots of hours of volunteering, but they will reach out to their networks and even um, look for further volunteers to create videos or to find stories. And so it's been a really um, great thing to have them um, be so involved. Um, we are, we also um, reach out to organizations in our state to partner with our statewide patient network of patients and families. Um, to help them with their work. So in the last uh, year, you'll see the 4 people that we or 4 organizations that we have partnered with. Um, the Minnesota Department of Health um, has come and presented to our group. Multiple times um, we've talked about um, the in person care partner and, and visitor restrictions. They've also asked um, about some infection control and some. Um, stories that they were looking for. The Minnesota Medical Association has used our group um, for, oh goodness, at Pulsed. Um, it's a document that patients have at the end of life for planning, and they wanted to learn more about that from our patients and families. And so they came to our uh, group to share. We've also had a shared decision making collaborative come to the meetings. And we've used this group to help plan our um, MAPS patient safety conference. And um, it's just really exciting because our work continues to expand as we move ahead. Next slide, please. So I wanted to give an example of something really specific we've done. Um, this was a project done in collaboration with the Rural Health Hospital. A physician from the U of M, um, Stratus Health was on our team and MAPS. Um, and the goal was that through co-design with uh, community members, staff, and the research uh, expert, we would improve test management upon discharge uh, from an emergency room in rural health. Um, next slide, please. The first thing that we needed to do was to, um, we wanted to start with our patients right from the beginning. And so we needed to invite them in. So we used first existing structures when, whenever we could. We tapped into the PFAT group and invited them. 
we knew that a lot of the um, people that came in for care in the ER were Medicaid recipients. And so this um, hospital had a program called food pharmacy where these uh, Medicare recipients would receive uh, food once a month. When they came in to receive their food, we um, had surveys that they could take uh, regarding the emergency room and um, testing. And we also invited them to be a part of our work groups. We looked at grievances that the uh, hospital had had over the last year to see if there were any that would fit this um, project. And then we got creative because it can be hard to find um, patients and community members that want to participate. I would say sometimes the reason they don't want to participate is they don't think they have any value. And so that was part of our um, uh, goal was to show how uh, much we needed them and what their value was. So we did uh, community wide surveys. And then one of our patient partners actually went into the quilting club and the rotary club to recruit patients to be part of our project, which was really uh, fun to do. Next, next slide, please. So the best practices that we used during this project is that we did utilize patients from the beginning and to the end. We aimed to have equal numbers of staff and patient partners at every meeting, which we were successful at. It was exciting. Um, strive for diversity. Patient partners should represent your community and your project. And then look for stories and be willing to use them for improvement. At one of our um, work groups, um, just by happenstance, somebody raised their hand and had a perfect story about her mom um, who had been in the ER, had gotten a test done, and nobody had followed up with her. Nobody told her the results, um, and she had a co-infection that needed treatment. So by the time they found it, um, she was already in the hospital and and much farther along than she might have been had they given her the test results um, in a timely manner. And so we used that story as part of our project and shared that um, as we went along. And then be real, there's no need to be non-medical with patients in the room. They're really good at raising their hand, asking questions, and they follow along really well. So um, the doctor is actually the one that kept saying, we can be real, right? And so that was helpful to re 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 remind them of that. Next slide, please. I wanted to just give you a little feel for the project. Um, I'm no good at workflow charts, but as you can see on the left, this was uh, the current state that we started with. It was kind of scary for the patients in the room um, to know that that's what that looked like to get a test result uh, communicated to them. The reason for it is they had three different types of ER docs. Um, some came from out of state, some were regular ER docs, and some were clinic docs. And so all of them had a different process, which made it very complicated and gave room for lots of um, potential errors. On the right, you will see that through our work group meetings with patients and families and the team at the hospital, this is what we came up with. And it was a much cleaner, simpler um, flow for their work. We are, they have implemented it. They have started implementing it this spring. And the plan is for in the fall to go back into the charts and see if it, it made a difference and was successful um, in preventing some of those uh, mishaps. Next slide, please. So what we learned, most hospital follow-up systems and healthcare systems, and I would say most everything in healthcare systems are designed around the providers or the organization, not the patients. And this contributes to the follow-up system failures and highlights why we need to co-design systems with patients and community members. Next slide, please. And this was the feedback from the people in the room, um, both staff and patients. I won't read them all, but um, one leader said, we turned it a disaster into something I can understand. Uh, patient said, this is one of the best process mapping pro uh, processes I've ever been part of. I loved the collaboration and honesty. And a doctor said, this can be a model uh, for future work. 
And one more, the patient partner said, my favorite part was seeing that messy culture chart transform into an actual flow chart that was easy to follow. So it was really successful. Next slide, please. Um, we're running a little short on time, so I'm going to try to get through this one really quick. Um, this was another project we had within assisted living facilities. Um, they were getting new legislation, new regulations in Minnesota. Um, and we wanted to make sure MAP set out to create a better solution for assisted living facilities to partner with residents and families in co-designing solutions. Um, resident councils and family councils uh, you may be really familiar with, and, and they serve a purpose, but um, from what we found, they tend to create tension between the councils and the staff, and not a lot of good things come out of it. There's not a lot of solutions uh, being had. And so we um, created something called a community advisory board. Um, staff intentionally invited those residents and families to partner with them. Um, they even went so far as including them in planning the first few meetings and all meetings afterwards. Um, they found ways to invest in the residents' ideas, even if it was small. And I can give you one example. One was that they were there was a lot of commotion in the eating area. And they were concerned that people were going to fall. And so the one resident said, why can't you just put a few extra chairs out so that we can take a break when we have our walkers when we're waiting to get in? Very simple. They did it the very next day. And, and that actually created a lot of trust in the patients and families to know that they were valued, that their ideas were good, and that there was value in coming to these meetings because the organizations would listen and try to implement when they could. And so as they found success, they actually asked the residents um, for more um, input, and it just created this really unique uh, partnership where everybody felt good. It, it just wasn't that kind of bumping heads anymore, um, but it, it just felt really good to come together. And we did that in um, uh, four different communities and they all had the same success. So it was, it was really exciting. We hope at MAPS to continue um, building some of these um, projects in other sites. So the diagnostic error project and the community advisory board, because it really shows the value of uh, co-creating in partnering with uh, patients and families to create safe care. Next slide, please. So uh, thank you for having me today. And I hope I just leave you with this one uh, idea is that the possibilities for partnership with patients and families truly are endless. And I would suggest just having fun with it, thinking about ways that you can um, include them in, 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 in ways that are fun for everyone and um, not um, burdensome. So thank you for uh, inviting me today to speak and share. Uh, thank you, Lisa. This is fantastic. And thank you, Jennifer. Um, and just debrief from from everything that you've learned today. Um, and we recognize that everyone's at a different place on the journey of including patients and families um, in their work and certainly in co-producing. So we have two questions. You can choose one. Uh, what are some of the benefits of engaging patients and families in safety? And the second, what was one new thing you learned about how to meaningfully engage age patients and families and safety. Agree to input your answer into the chat box, or if you would like to speak, raise your hand, and we will try yet again with our technology to um, allow you to speak. So we'll just look for uh, someone to raise their hand. In the interim, Jade, there was a question for Lisa, and maybe Lisa could answer oh. that while, while we're waiting for others to chime in in the chat. So, Lisa, the question, if you're not seeing it, have you ever recruited or would you consider using patients and families who've had a grievance and embed them in the clinical work? Yes, yeah, so I was just typing and so that's great. I will answer it. Hi, Armando. Yes, 
We frequently suggest uh, using people who have had uh, grievances or errors happen. Um, it can be really scary uh, for hospital or for any organization uh, to do that. But what we find typically is once that they've been listened to and invited to be part of the work, those grievances go away and they they feel a lot better about it. So it's a great idea and, and we really try to do that and suggest it. Great, thank you so much. And I'm not seeing any hands raised, but we do have quite a few comments. Just keep them coming. Uh, from Jen, um, I liked framing the partnership with invite, include, invest, and increase partnerships. Um, that's great. You know, I think one of my key takeaways uh, from both Sue and Lisa's presentation is about um, inclusivity. And I, I couldn't help but think, you know, if we would just be more inclusive as opposed as opposed to exclusive and look for reasons to bring more people in and it, and um, it, that abundance begins to roll in when we do that. Uh, question for Lisa. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, that's a, a, another one. Um, we're hearing from um, Mary that this builds partnership and ownerships and accountability. Thank you. Uh, Betsy has commented, what we need is a shift in hearts and minds to allow for authentic partnerships with patients and families. Isn't that the truth? Um, it really does down to relationships always. Uh, engaging patients and families in safety offers a new perspective and ensures transparency and promotes trust. And from Lyndon, um, who stated, I learned to change my mindset to start viewing the patient as the expert. And, you know, I would like to add to that. I thought um, it's, it's an older concept, but it's one that hasn't been um, uh, widely used in our community, and that is designing for, for the patient. Um, I know that years ago, uh, when I was doing some organ transplantation work, it was the Mayo Clinic that completely redesigned their uh, transplant center so that the patient never moved, but the clinicians moved. And um, there was a whole host of efficiencies gained, but most importantly, um, the follow-up and um, for those patients and getting them listed quicker uh, was experienced. So I think that's just one of you know many examples of what can happen when we design with the patient in mind. Um, let's see. I also learned that there is an uh, an SDM collaborative in Minnesota, and I'd like to be put in contact with that group. So we will work to get that to you. Um, and yeah, so uh, Chris is saying I liked changing from advisors to partners. Yep, what a um, what the slightest change in language can do. How powerful that can be. Well, thank you everyone for all of all of the great comments, the wonderful presentations. I feel like we all have taken a lot away. If I could have the next slide. Um, at ARC, we like to say, you know, there's a tool for that. Um, and ARC has made a significant investment in patient and family engagement over the years. And most recently has um, pulled together a synthesis on improving healthcare safety by engaging patients and families. Um, this is available on ARC's website and you'll see in the um, the link at the bottom, uh, the this synthesis, it, particularly in the appendix, is just a wealth of information. And it's easily made at your fingertips, and so I hope you'll take a few minutes to um, take a look at that. If I could have the next slide, please. Additionally, um, also on the ARC website, you'll see under home patient safety, and then a a tab on engaging patients and families are a list of tools and resources that are available to you. And those include um, things like engaging patients and families at the primary care and in diagnostic safety, uh, which is one of our latest tools. So I hope you'll take a moment to, uh, to review those based on where you intend to uh, focus first. And the next slide, please. And then uh, we would just like to tee up the next summer webinar will be held on August 22nd, again, from 2 to 3 p.m. Eastern time. 
and our focus will be on engaging boards and executive leadership and safety, which is a subject we've touched a little bit upon today. Um, this call is going to be sponsored by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, and it is going to be an outstanding call. So we hope that you will um, begin to register for that now. Registration is open and can be found on the National Action Alliance website, which is on the ARC webpage, and that link is live in these in these slides. And the next slide, please. Yep, that was the end of it. We just like to um, thank you again for being with us today and look forward to learning more about what you're doing and to partner with uh, patients and families. Our meeting is adjourned. Thank you.